Ned Kelly's Secret Journey to Van Diemen's Land by Victor Maloney, 2013. The paintings and related story is my interpretation of a tale that my father told my brother and I many years ago about a little known journey by bush ranger Ned Kelly to Van Diemen's Land, more commonly known now as Tasmania, back in 1875. Ned had been working as an overseer on a station at King River, Victoria at the time and decided to quietly make a trip back to the place where his father John had originally set foot on this continent. Ned thought that after talking to his father, Van Steenman Land would be a likely place to raise some quick finance in order to help his mother with some court expenses. The scene opens in the backyard of a working class home in Osborne, South Australia where the young boy is struck with a thud into his black cardboard helmet. He'd been playing with his brother in the backyard in the late 1950s. Then the scene takes us to the wharf of Outer Harbour where the boy's father is telling the daydreaming lad about Ned Kelly's secret journey to Van Diemen's Land. As the boy looks into the murky ocean, the characters in the story seem to come to life. The scene then goes to a rowdy bar in Victoria somewhere where a red-headed man is causing a roar of laughter while dressed as a woman. Ned and Dan Kelly appear in the hotel just as he leaves, but are told by a friend that the man is his father. Two policemen also observe the scene and begin to grin, which only angers the Kelly brothers further. Now when Ned and Dan arrive home, their mother mentions that she had just been visited by the local police and been given some hard treatment about her owing money to the court regarding court fees. Ned finds his father had just returned from the backyard after he seemed to be burying something with a shovel. Ned is later horrified to find a box in the ground, the same blue woman's dress in it that his friend has seen his father wearing in the hotel. After a violent fight with his father, Ned makes a quiet decision to undertake a trip to Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania, to raise some cash for his mother and get away from the tense home situation with his father. And the story pans out from there with Ned Kelly jumping ship and arriving on a freight ship at Port Arthur Jail and finding a place to hide near the jail. During the journey, Ned encounters Tasmanian bush rangers who have some nasty plans for him, witnesses a horrible sight on Dead Man's Island, just off Port Arthur, and Ned falls in love. This is how the story pans out, Ned Kelly's secret journey to Tasmania. Part one of the insight into Ned Kelly's secret journey, Port Arthur's jail is melting. In 1875, Ned Kelly decided to take a short leave of absence from his overseer work on the station at King River to raise some cash in lieu of helping his mother to pay some court costs that she had incurred. He packed a kit bag with survival essentials and some of his protective armour and made a quiet horse ride to the dock in Melbourne, not telling any of his family in case they might be questioned about his whereabouts. He then boarded a ship under the cover of darkness, which was heading for Van Diemen's land to find a good cash haul which his father had told him many years earlier could be found in the treacherous place that his father had described as hell on earth. Ned was relieved later to be standing on solid ground after a pretty rough cruise. Here now is my interpretation of my father's story looking through the eyes of Ned. Well thank the good Lord for that, said Ned, not exactly adventure in paradise, not enough that the ship was tossed around in those turbulent waters like a cork in a river, but the cursed yellow toothed water rats in my lifeboat were just a little too friendly. It's sure a relief to stretch my stiff wooden like legs on the back road to the Port Arthur Jail in good old Van Diemen's land. This old disused gunpowder shed should be a good initial observation point for me. There seemed to be some widespread chaos happening with the convicts. The officers on duty appeared to be staggering around the watch house in quite an inebriated state while there was a mass of prisoners roaming randomly across the main exercise area of the jail. They reminded me of cattle being confused by pistol shooting and almost roaming around the circle. About half an hour later, they aimlessly appeared to head back to their cells while their intoxicated guards seemed to be slowly coming to their senses. There appeared to have been a total meltdown in the jail, but a sense of order seemed to be slowly emerging while their intoxicated guards seemed to be slowly coming to their senses. There appeared to have been a total meltdown in the jail, but a sense of order seemed to be slowly emerging. Not too far from my hideaway in the small red brick old gunpowder room, I noticed 
A group of convicts with caps and masks attached somehow with ropes and wandering aimlessly around in some type of involuntary dazed state. It reminded me of some of the stories that my father told me of the mental asylums in England. There was also quite a bad odour coming from the group and one wondered if they were ever allowed to bathe. One of the sad looking group suddenly fell to the rocky ground but was soon back on his feet with a little persuasion from the boot of one of the guards. I peered across a small wall and noticed the misery of a poor soul being whipped brutally while he was tied to some type of wooden upright frame. I've often wondered how man can be so cruel to his fellow man and if the value of mercy is ever underrated. When the flogging was eventually over, the strong looking man applying the punishment seemed to be almost completely exhausted, so no one can imagine how much excruciating pain he must have inflicted with his cat of nine tails on his poor soul, who now lay face down in the dirt. My attention was now moved back to the gang of masked convicts, and one of them seemed to be staring straight at me as a tear dropped from their eye. Something about this person was different, and for some reason I knew that, if it was at all possible, I needed to talk to them. As I stood contemplating the situation, a fight broke out in a small group of convicts not far away, and all the guards were went in to sort things out. Just then the masked prisoner that had caught my attention quickly left the others in the group and came through a small gate into the back of my hiding place. This was quite a surprise, and the prisoner removed the head covering to reveal themselves to be a woman. My name is Julia McKenzie, she said, I need to get away from this place. Can I come with you? She asked, with a look of genuine despair in her face. I told her that it could become very dangerous, but she said that living like a tiger in a cage was far worse. The fight between the group of prisoners had become far more serious by now, so Juliet and I were able to quietly leave the hideaway and head for the safety of the woods without much trouble. That afternoon, Juliet and I forced our way through thick bushland before finally arriving at a clearing which seemed to be a good place to rest and relax for a little while. What a strange th thing fate can be. I came to this place, now known as Tasmania, to gather gold and I find myself sitting on a rock under the shade of a gum tree next to a clear flowing stream, looking into the eyes of the most beautiful woman that I've ever seen. We took some fresh water from the stream in my flask to quench our deep thirst and enjoyed some of the beef jerky that I'd brought in my backpack. Being late November, the weather was becoming quite warm, but we were pretty content now, being satisfied with our bellies full and our throats quenched. Juliet lay back onto my chest as we rested on the cool rock and life seemed unbelievably good after the troubles that I'd had with the local constabulary at home. As the day became hotter, Juliet suggested taking a swim, provided I promised not to stare at her. With a round of laughter, we both removed our sweaty, grimy clothes, gave them a rinse in the stream and placed them across a nearby tree branch to dry. The cool, clear water was most refreshing and relaxing. Juliet kept herself down in the water, up to her shoulders, and she gave me a pointed finger sign and shook her head. I, I then thought that maybe we could stay in this area for a few days to regenerate ourselves and further plan our journey. I'd also noticed a public tavern nearby, which may offer a good night's rest and a hot meal. After we organised ourselves, we headed for the tavern, which didn't seem to be real busy. After finding a vacant table, Juliet and I were able to book a room and we ordered some Irish stew and veggies and a bottle of red wine. Juliet had been to the room to freshen up and the landlady had given her some of her spare clothes and she looked like an angel in the red dress. After spending a night in heaven with Juliet in the tavern, we decided to get ourselves packed ready to travel on our way. I purchased some more beef jerky and some bread and scones from the tavern to keep us going for a little while. By now it was nearly noon, so we decided to head to the nearby stream for one more cool dip. Juliet wasn't as shy on this occasion, and we once more enjoyed the revitalising water. Not too long after we became settled in the stream, I noticed a creature heading towards the water to quench its thirst, which I noticed was a thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger, as they are now known. I'd heard stories about these animals being still found in some remote areas of southern Victoria from my father, who also informed me of their being rather timid of mankind, but often unfriendly and untamable.
As the thylacine drank quickly, it cast its eyes towards us, who were about 12 feet away. We always had a good relationship with animals, both domestic and wild, so I didn't think that it would cause us any problems. In fact, I believe that some animals make better friends than humans and can be trusted more. The thylacine was giving me a friendly gaze, so I moved closer to him to suss him out. He then moved his head toward my face. It was one of the most amazing things that I'd ever experienced. He licked my face with his wet, coarse tongue and then wandered away. Juliet thought that the whole thing was very funny, but an unfriendly noise from behind us soon dispelled her laughter. Well, you would not have believed it. We were now confronted by two ugly, smelly and armed bush rangers. Don't move an inch, you two. Black Freddy and Crazy Harry here. You don't appear to have any loot to plunder from you, so we're taking you both hostage. A pretty wench comes with me, because I need a cook and someone to keep my tent warm at night. And you with that helmet on can go with Crazy Harry. He's a little different from me. Just then, almost before the words were finished coming from his mouth, Black Freddy was leapt upon by my befriended thylacine and dragged to the rocky ground, while its large fangs moved closer to his craggy face. Crazy Harry wasn't safe either, when a Tasmanian devil jumped at him and started biting his ankles. Our new creatures of the wild had come to the rescue, and it was time to hit the trail. My father had also mentioned stories he'd heard about some treasure being hidden at a place called Dead Man's Island, next to Port Arthur Jail, so we next decided to investigate the place. After a fairly tiring walk, we found a small cave overlooking the island and decided to rest there for the night and find a way to get across there in the morning. After rising at daybreak, Juliet and I filled our bellies with some of our provisions and then got our things together to work out the next step. The good Lord might have been on our side because we found an abandoned dinghy not too far along the river bed. So it was now time to inspect this dead man's island, or island of the dead. When we pulled into the banks of the island, we carefully made our way up the hill to a place that was full of old gravestones and buried vaults which, we, while we wondered if anyone alive was on the island, there was a strange sense of mystery about the place. Then we heard a human voice and spotted a body lying on the ground near what seemed to be a fairly freshly dug grave. The man with the shovel was singing some ditty. I bury him deep, I bury him low, from the top of their heads to the tips of their toes. The veggies I grow are the best in the land. I have the most organic fertiliser known to man. Well, it looked like he was ready to place the body in the grave without a coffin, but suddenly something stopped him in his tracks. A group of wild thylacines and Tasmanian devils had surrounded the grave digger, and the law of the jungle seemed to be taking over. Suddenly one of the thylacines leapt up at the grave digger and forced him to flee to his nearby cabin, which had a pile of empty wine bottles scattered across the front yard. There was a drowning noise of squealing and barking, so I can't totally be certain, but I thought that I actually heard the man lying prostrate on the ground, screaming. I can't relate in words the sight that we witnessed then, but I thought that if ever I was badly injured in the bush, I dread the thought of becoming a living human lunch for one of these carnivorous creatures that had really turned wild. I just told Juliet not to look and put my hand over her eyes as we heard the final, final squeals being snuffed out and then all we could hear was a horrible noise and the grinding of bone. That was Dead Man's Island and I just wonder what would happen if those bush rangers had have ended up on here. After the events at the gravesite we decided not to continue our search for treasure on Dead Man's Island. The thylacines by the tavern were quite friendly but these ones seemed to have acquired a disturbing taste for human flesh. I just wonder if future generations who may visit Dead Man's Island will ever know how these poor souls were put to rest especially if there was still a flicker of life in them before they came to look into the throat of a hungry, wild creature. So we returned to the Port Arthur area in the dinghy and headed for the coal mines to seek our fortune. When we came around a bend in the dirt track near the mine site, we encountered a policeman who didn't seem real happy. I thought they might have tried to arrest me, but while I cocked my pistol at him, he told me that it was sick of being stationed at the mines and would soon be transferred to Victoria. These men are worse than animals. I can't relate to you some of the things that they get up to in their prison cells, but I've had enough of it all, he said. He said. He also said that they were allowed to have a wash in the river once a week, but most of the men refused the offer. It seemed to prefer to dwell in their own slough and possibly pass around their own diseases. 
because everyone used the same eating utensils. He told us as we headed away that by next week he'll be stationed in Victoria at a place called Glen Rowan. Also on the way to the gold mines we saw a sign advertising a major horse race the following day so he set off for a day at the races. By now looking to finish my Van Diemen's Land journey I hadn't been able to gain any wealth except for the lovely lady by my side so I decided that we should head to the racing track for the rich rewards of the Van Diemen's Cup. As we stood by one of the horse stables a well-dressed man came up to me and asked me if I could ride. Certainly can I said. Then he replied my jockey's just taken ill with a stomach virus so you can ride my horse if you want and collect a bag of money if you win. Sounded pretty good to me so I thought I'd give it a go. Juliet wished me good luck as I headed for the starting gate on my fair filly. I had some trouble holding my horse in check as she bolted along the track but were able to get across the finish post first. The race organisers then handed me a bag of money. They said that I had to give an interview and that the horse's owner would want to share the winnings with me. Well I had bigger fish to fry and a detour through one of the stable's back doors found Juliet and I was back on the dirt track to plan our further destination. I thought I'd have no trouble getting back to Victoria on a ship but was worried about the safety of Juliet coming with me. So we went back to the courthouse hotel for one more farewell drink. Farewell for now Juliet, I'll be back for you, I said, once I get some matters sorted out at home. I had a lump in my chest, I gave her a big hug and her teary eyes were all round. I did hope that I would see her again but had no idea what would be ahead of me when I went back to Victoria.